Imagine a machine so powerful, it harnesses the crushing pressure of the deep ocean to create fresh drinking water. Without burning fossil fuels, without spewing toxic brine into the sea, and without the massive land footprint of traditional desalination plants. Now imagine it working in near silence, 2,000 feet beneath the waves. It sounds like sci-fi, but it's already happening. And if it works, it could solve one of humanity's most urgent challenges, the global freshwater crisis. But how does it work, and will it live up to the hype? Every year, droughts become more severe, water reservoirs run dry, and entire cities, once thriving on rivers, aquifers, and rainfall, are scrambling for alternatives. In the American Southwest, Lake Mead's bathtub rings are the scar tissue of a civilization running out of water. Forty million people rely on the Colorado River. But after 25 years of uninterrupted drought, that lifeline is breaking. And it's not just the U.S. Drought now expands across the globe at a rate of nearly 100,000 square kilometers each year. That's the combined size of Vermont and New Hampshire turning arid annually. So why not use the ocean? After all, over 96% of Earth's water is saline. Desalination already exists, but its dirty secret? It's energy-hungry, fossil-fueled, and environmentally damaging. That's where Deep Sea Reverse Osmosis, DSRO, comes in, and it's turning heads fast. Let's break it down. Traditional reverse osmosis, RO plants, work by forcing salt water through a semi-permeable membrane using high-pressure pumps, typically consuming about 3 kilowatt hours of electricity per cubic meter of fresh water. In 2016, global desalination consumed 75 terawatt hours of electricity. That's as much as the entire country of Chile used in the same year. And where does that power come from? Mostly fossil fuels. As a result, RO plants spewed 76 million tons of CO2 in 2016. By 2040, that number could surge to 218 million tons annually as demand for fresh water skyrockets. The irony? We're solving one environmental crisis, water scarcity, by worsening another. A new generation of startups and energy engineers is proposing a radical rethink. Go deeper, not bigger. By moving desalination offshore, deep offshore, they can tap into a free, limitless source of pressure, the weight of the ocean itself. At depths of 400 to 600 meters, hydrostatic pressure reaches 40 to 60 bar nearly equal to the force applied by onshore pumps in traditional RO systems. Instead of pushing water through the membrane with fossil-fueled pumps, DSRO systems create suction on the clean side of the membrane, allowing deep-sea pressure to do the heavy lifting. Enter Oceanwell and Flotion, two of the most advanced players in the space. Oceanwell's pods stand 13 meters tall, about 40 feet, and are designed to sit silently on the seafloor. Water is drawn in, passed through RO membranes, and piped back to the shore through long, flexible umbilicals. The membranes operate with 1.7 to 2.1 kilowatt hours per cubic meter, up to 40% more efficient than standard RO. But pressure isn't the only advantage. The deep ocean's stable temperature and low biodiversity reduce biofouling, the buildup of algae and microorganisms that clogs the filter. This means DSRO pods can avoid using the toxic chemical cocktails required for pretreatment in onshore plants, such as chlorine, bisulfite, and scale inhibitors. But what about the brine? Traditional RO plants concentrate the remaining salt into brine, about 58% of the intake water gets dumped back, often loaded with chemicals. Brine is denser than seawater, sinks to the bottom, and creates oxygen-depleted dead zones. Over 155 million tons of this brine are dumped into oceans every day. 
Oceanwell claims its pods return 85 to 95 percent of the intake water back to the sea, only slightly more saline than before. That discharge is released higher into the water column to prevent brine accumulation on the seafloor, allowing ocean currents to carry it away. The biggest win here isn't just energy savings, it's reduced environmental stress. DSRO avoids the massive land footprint of onshore plants, shrinking required space by up to 90%. This matters in dense coastal zones like California, the Mediterranean, or island nations like the Maldives. Flotion recently completed a four-month pilot and is preparing a 1,000 cubic meter per day demo, roughly 260,000 gallons. Oceanwell is aiming for a full-scale plant by 2028, serving Los Angeles with up to 95,000 cubic meters, 25 million gallons per day, enough for a small city. Two pods will produce 28,000 acre-feet per year. Of course, cost is still a hurdle. Running pipelines and power cables 10 kilometers offshore isn't cheap. That's why future systems may tap into offshore wind turbines, creating a self-powered desalination grid independent of the main electrical infrastructure. If scaled, DSRO could provide affordable, sustainable fresh water to coastal megacities, potentially disrupting the $32 billion global desalination market. Energy savings alone could reduce OPEC's operating expenses by 30 to 40 percent. And there's a strategic angle. Countries that rely on massive water imports or face water stress, like Saudi Arabia, Israel, Spain, and India, could leapfrog current limitations by deploying these underwater systems. No single technology will solve the water crisis, but deep CRO is a leap forward. A way to desalinate with less energy, fewer emissions, and minimal marine damage. It could buy us time while we scale up renewables, rethink agriculture, and fix our broken water infrastructure. In the end, DSRO may not be the perfect solution, but it's smarter, cleaner, deeper. So the question isn't whether we'll run out of water, it's whether we'll adapt in time. This is iTech, and we're watching the future surface one drop at a time. Would you trust your city's water to machines on the ocean floor? And should deep sea desalination be public infrastructure or a private gold rush? Thanks for watching.